In this series, we're digging deep into the discussion that Jesus had with the woman at the well of Sychar. And this discussion is recorded in the Gospel of John and only in the Gospel of John. So, so far, we've concentrated on just one word ideas. As we've been in the series, we just pick one word. And that one word idea is something we've used to just go into the conversation and try to reveal from the conversation, especially this, what it means truly to belong to Jesus. This past December, we had here at our church something called the uh, Christmas Family, what do we call it? Family Out, Christmas Family Adventure. And we invited the neighbors to come, and I think we had up to about 500 people who came to the Christmas Family Adventure. How many of you were there? This, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of you and your kids, and we had a whole bunch of neighbors. I was talking to a neighbor, I, I met neighbors, and I went up to one guy. I said, hi, how are you? And, and uh, where are you from? I'm from the neighborhood. And I said, you have your kids here? And he said, yeah, I have my kids here. And there were a whole bunch of kids over there playing. And he said, um, that one there, and that one there, and that one there belong to me. He said, they belong to me. And I still remember the way he said it. They belong to me. And today we're talking, uh, uh, continuing to talk about this idea of belonging. And I want to ask you if you believe that if Jesus were calling out people, (laughs) that one, that one, that one, that one belongs to me. That one belongs to me and that one belongs to me, would you be picked? The words that we've used so far in this series, the first one, in the first of the series was conversation. It was the word conversation, and we showed how Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with each of us. Imagine if each of us, as followers of Jesus, would just have a conversation, maybe just a conversation every day with Jesus. Some of you are so close to your friends, or your parents, some of you, you're close to your mom. You and your mom text and talk every day, or maybe two or three or four times a day. And uh, what if we did that with Jesus? What if we had a relationship with Jesus where we talked to Jesus every day? So the first word was conversation, as we look at this conversation. The second week, we used the word discomfort. We showed how sometimes Jesus, in our relationship with Jesus, he takes us to places that are uncomfortable, so that we can grow and mature in our relationship with him. Last week, Father's Day, it was the word wonder. Wonder. It was about how being a disciple of Jesus requires us to be curious. Really, to follow Jesus, you have to be curious. You have to be open to the wonder of the supernatural. You have to be. Because Jesus operates in the supernatural. We are in the natural. Jesus operates in the supernatural. And you have to be open to that. Now, today, trust. That's our word today. So let's talk about trust for a minute. <clears throat> you just mentioned to someone else maybe a brand or a product or an establishment that you trust. So I took a look this week, found a survey that was done in March, just a few months ago. And um, it, this survey determined the most trusted brands in America. And so I'm going to read to you the top 10. I'm going to go from 10 to 1, Okay. So number 10, FedEx. Number nine, the Weather Channel. (laughs) Uh, Number eight, Dove. Number seven, Visa. Number six, I love this one, Cheerios. I trust Cheerios. Number five, Kleenex. Number four, Lysol. Number three, Amazon. Number two, most trusted product name in America, UPS. And you ready for number one? Oak Hills Church. No, uh, band- <coughs> Band-Aid brand adhesive bandages. Can you believe that? That is the most... How many of you trust Band-Aid? Just be honest. You trust Band-Aid. See, there you go. On the other end of the scale, I thought we should look at this. As of this month, June, these are the most hated brands in America. And I'm going to start with number seven and move to number one. Number seven, TikTok. Number six, Spirit Airlines. Number five, Meta. Number four, Twitter. Number three, Fox Corporation. Number two, FTX, which is a cryptocurrency exchange company, or it was. And number one, the Trump Organization. 
Now, many of you are saying, I don't really trust surveys. You know what I mean? <laughs> but here's something interesting that they found in doing the most trusted brands, going back to that, the most trusted, not the most hated. Uh, the level of trust is not consistent among age groups. I found this interesting. Across all demographics of American adults, the report points out that Gen Z consumers, okay, if you wonder who Gen Z, right now they're probably between the age of 10 and 25. So all of you Gen Xers and all of you boomers, you need to stop now complaining about millennials. You can move to the Gen Z and you can start <laughs> complaining about them, okay? <clears throat> but that age group, uh, 10 to 25 year olds, tend to have sig significantly less trust in all areas by a number of points uh, compared to their counterpoints, counterparts. And here's my own experience. In the two or three years leading up to the pandemic, and then during the pandemic, and then since that time when we pretty much come out of the pandemic, I've never in my lifetime had so many conversations about trust. Specifically, who to trust? Who can you trust? This has been a big one, and it's probably been true of you too. And one thing we all seem to know in these conversations is who we don't trust or who we hate. So after having so many discussions with others about who we can't trust, um, and I just, I just thought, what, are, what were the most popular themes of kind of people or places uh, or institutions that people distrust the most? And I don't know if you found this, but I have four that I think have come to the top. This is just my own experience, okay? No survey done here. Number one, distrust politics and politicians. Number two, media outlets. Number three, medical establishments. That's a big one. Anybody having to do with the medical? I've had a lot of conversations. You can't trust those people. Number four, pastors and churches. And that has been a big one lately as well. That seems to be growing in distrust. The conversations almost always end something like this. Well, you just don't know who to trust anymore. But let's get more personal. If you are blessed, there are people in your life that you fully trust. And you have a record with them of trust so that it's pretty strong. I mentioned to you that I trust my wife. Um, 1980, uh, we got married, and she has given no reason to not trust her. In fact, she just continues to give me reasons to fully trust her, how she acts, how she speaks, what she says, what she does. Uh, so you've been blessed. Now, there are others, probably, that you don't trust at all. There's a company you hired to do work in your house or your business, and they did awful work. And so you tell everyone, don't use them, don't trust them. Or you've been let down so many times in your personal relationships that you have a problem trusting anyone. In fact, you don't trust anyone right now, as you sit here today, you become quite, you know, hardened and cynical because you just can't trust anyone. So why all this talk about distrust? Why such a long introduction? Well, it's an important lead into the section of the conversation that we're going to focus on today as we have been in this conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at the well of uh, Sychar. And based on the text, that we're going to read today, and really in the text, the whole thing. I believe that this woman had a difficult time trusting men. So it's fascinating, it's ironic, that she would find herself being asked the question at this point in her life by the most trusted and trusting man who ever lived. And that, of course, is Jesus. So I think it's really interesting of this dynamic that's going on here. And in this conversation, Jesus leads to a place where he will ask her, to trust him. That's where he's leading. I need you to trust me. Think about it. Folks, this is a key part of our discipleship as well, and this is a big lesson for us today. Those of us who follow Jesus, we need to ask our, ourselves, do we fully trust Jesus with every area of our life, our future, our finances, 
our kids, our marriage? Do we trust with relationships that we think somebody's getting away with something? Do we trust when we've been hurt? Do we trust in every area of our life? So let's read this part of the conversation now, and then we'll just dig into it a little more. We'll pull out some phrases in the conversation, see what we can learn about trust. This is John 4, 16. At this, Jesus said, <clears throat> he's had a long conversation with her so far, but at this, Jesus said, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I do not have a husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I do not have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and the man you are now living with is not your husband. You have said this truthfully. I think this is really interesting that twice Jesus said, you have told the truth. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place where one ought to worship is in Jerusalem at the temple. Jesus replied, woman, believe me, a time is coming when God's kingdom comes, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Verse 22. You Samaritans, Jesus still talking, you Samaritans do not know what you worship. We Jews do know what we worship, for salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and is already here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, from the heart, the inner self, and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind, And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So now let's dig in and start with this line. Uh, Go call your husband and come back. We found out last week that this woman could have shut down the conversation anytime. She could have just quit talking to him. But it's interesting that she was intrigued enough in this conversation with Jesus. She was just open enough, she was just open enough to the wonder, which we talked about last week, that she asked Jesus about the living water that he had just mentioned. It's easy to read this section of the conversation and conclude, let's talk about the woman for a minute, because maybe you've heard us preachers preach like this about the woman. It's easy to, you know, read the conversation and conclude this woman was immoral. She was unfaithful to her husbands, and consequently, We could then conclude that she probably moved carelessly from husband to husband and now was not even married to the one she lived with. That, of course, is a possibility. And we preachers have been preaching that for a long, long time. The thing is, we don't know that for sure because we just don't know. So let's consider a possible different scenario. Here it is. This woman married young is that was really the only way for a woman in this society to have a life, to have children, to have provision, to have a home. That's how the society worked, the culture worked. Men, on the other hand, could marry and easily divorce their wives. And I mean easily divorce their wives. They gave a certificate of divorce. They just wrote out, here's the reason why, and they could be divorced from their wives. So maybe this woman married, but then was rejected. She was divorced by her husband and then was rejected by all of these men for different reasons, possibly. Possibly one of the reasons wasn't just rejection. Maybe her husband or two had passed away. Maybe it was because she was rejected because she couldn't have children. So after being let down so many times, she had just simply had it with marriage and men, and so she clung to a man who had let her live in his home. The truth is, we just don't know why this woman had five husbands. Whatever the reasons for her situation, either her own mistakes or the mistreatment of five husbands, it's safe to conclude two things about her. Okay, One, the coming and going of all the husbands caused her to be the subject of gossip in town. For sure, this had to be the case. And this is why she was there at noon when no one else would have been there, the hottest time of the day. Certainly she was a topic of gossip in the morning and in the evening when the other women would gather. That's one thing, but also it's safe to say she just didn't trust men. But today, on this day at noon at the well, she met a man who immediately seemed different. At first, she she saw him uh, as maybe just one more 
unreliable, hurtful man. But I believe it in his tone, in his attitude, the way he looked at her, didn't make her feel like an object, didn't make her feel like she was insignificant. And he talked about living water, and when she asked for some of that water, he told her, go get your husband. And this is interesting. Jesus did not ask her this to shame her or to insist that she repent, but this is important. He asked her this question to reveal to her who he was because he was about to tell her history. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. What Jesus wanted to do was reveal to her who he was. See, when we realize who Jesus really is, we know that he's the one who can free us of our shame, our mistakes, our sin, our confusion about life, our challenges and relationships. When we really, truly realize who Jesus is, then we realize Jesus is the one who can do that. And did you notice what the woman said? I mentioned this as we read it. When Jesus asked her to go get her husband, she didn't try to evade the question. She didn't try to give a clever answer. She told the truth. I do not have a husband. I've mentioned already a few times in this series how much I admire this woman. And here's another time why I really like her. She was truthful. She was just truthful. And she could sense, I believe, Jesus' heart, his empathy, and that he was not trying to embarrass her. I want to stop for a minute and just tell you the overall focus of this series, Belong. So whenever we do a series, I don't know if you think that I just wake up one morning and go, well, let's try this, okay? But I do think about it, I do pray about it. And then I usually put together a little summary, give it a title, and then I talk about what it's going to be about, and then I list every sermon we're going to do, and then I give a little summary. And so a number of weeks ago, whatever, whenever we started planning today, or this series, I handed to our service planning group the summary of this series. And this is the summary I gave to the team. Listen, this series, Belong, is a focus on the conversation Jesus had with a Samaritan woman that reveals how we can truly belong to Jesus Christ. I felt strongly that many of us have had religious background, and we've been in church a long time, I have, all my life. And I just wanted to spend a few weeks talking about and having us think about, do I really belong to Jesus? Do I really? What does that mean to belong to Jesus? Folks, if we want to see what Jesus is like, if we want to know his heart and his intentions toward us, if we want to know what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus and not have a dry religion, We see a perfect model for that right here in this conversation. And we see what it really means to belong to Jesus. And we see it more and more clearly as the conversation progresses. Jesus wants this woman to know that he is the Messiah, that she has been hearing about all her life, and that he has come not to condemn her, but to save her and to be in relationship with her. So after Jesus tells her things about her past that there is no way he could have known, She says, sir, I see that you are a prophet. I see that you are a prophet. Sometimes when we think of prophets in the Bible, we think of Old Testament prophets. Maybe you've read the Old Testament, and you know names like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Ezekiel. They brought the word of the Lord to Israel. And sometimes we think they only talked about future events and bringing warnings to proclaim to people these warnings. You know, if you keep up this kind of lifestyle and behavior, they would say, things are going to happen. i just tell you, this is what's going to happen to you. But Old Testament prophets prophets also brought words of blessing and hope as well. If you turn from your ways, if you honor God in your life, blessing will come to you. God will bless you. God will deliver you. So here at the well, we see this happening on a personal level. Just as the Old Testament prophets pointed out to Israel what life had become for them when they rejected God. I mean, that's really what prophets did. Look at Israel. Look at what your life is at. Just look at your life. 
Now, this is because you rejected the God of love in your life. So just as the prophets did that, Jesus here simply points out what her life has been like outside of God and tells her, this woman, what life can be like with God. I mean, that alone is powerful. You know, Caroline Lewis, who uh, I'm taking this series from a little book of hers called Belonging, um, she believes that John describes sin in his gospel as living life apart from God. There's a lot of truth to that. Now listen to what she wrote. Not necessarily having to do with one's morals or scruples. It's not about labeling what you have done wrong, but rather that you are apart from God or not in a relationship with God or Jesus. Now we know the Bible is filled with laws. It's quite clear. It's pretty clear on sin. The Bible's clear on sinful actions in the law. But in a culture like we have in America, have you said anything like this lately? Have you felt this lately? It seems that we are in a culture in America where fewer and fewer things are considered to be sinful or wrong. We have a population today where many are living their lives in a state of being without God. Without God. And the Bible says that that way of living, in the end, is lonely, it's empty, it's unfulfilling, and leaves one searching for something that is truly living, that's truly eternal. So this woman keeps the conversation going with Jesus. He's just told her specific details about her life, and yet, knowing those details, he's compassionate and he's kind toward her. So what does uh, she do? She asks him a question about one of the most pressing theological issues of the day. Such an interesting conversation. She just, he just tells her about her life. She says, you must be a prophet. And then she asks a question, really, about one of the main for centuries. The Samaritans and Jews have been trying to figure this out. And this issue had separated Jews and Samaritans for all these years, for centuries. Here was the question. Hey, Jesus, where is the proper location to worship God? Where should we worship God? See, after the Jews returned from captivity, they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. But when they did that, the Samaritans had already been constructing their temple in Samaria on a place called Mount Gerizim. This woman, now believing this man was a prophet, thought that he might know the valid location of worshiping God, for worshiping God. Over the years, preachers like me have suggested that the reason she asks this question (laughs) is because she wants to deflect. Okay, you're getting too personal here. All right, that's too personal. So what I want to do is I want to deflect this conversation away from personal life. Let's, Let's get religious. This is what I think she, that we preachers have said over the years, and maybe you've read this, and too personal, too relationship, so let's, dis- let's distract. Let's, let's just talk about something religious for a while. But see, this is why, as I mentioned, I admire this woman the more I read about her. It doesn't seem as though she has spent her life purposely outside of God. It doesn't seem like she spent her whole life sinning and rebelling against God, just like, I hate God, I want to get away from God. She's actually here with this question She's actually here, spent much of her life hoping to understand God. This is a question that's on her heart. She wants to know what it means to truly worship God. So however she ended up at this point in her life, whatever her history, whatever her past, one thing we know, she has been a seeker. She's been looking. She wants to know the truth about God and worship and the meaning of her life. And since she's talking to a prophet, She's decided to ask the question she's wondered most of her life. Who is right, you Jews or us Samaritans? Okay, prophet, how does one really, truly worship God? Tell me, because I'd like to know. And I can't think of anything more applicable to our lives today than this. I mean, our lives today than this question right here. This is the question so many people in our world are asking. See, I believe most people that you and I know, wherever they presently find themselves. I really believe this. Whether they have three decades of history, two decades, four, five, six, seven, eight decades of history, 
whatever their history, wherever they find themselves, I believe that most didn't just decide to purposely, purposely rebel against God. They've just lived their lives in a state of being without God because their questions about God probably were not answered. So how does Jesus answer this question asked by this woman? What does Jesus say? Well, we read it, but let me read it to you again. And listen carefully. This is what Jesus said to her. The time is coming and is already here. He's talking about himself. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, from the heart, the inner self, and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, the anointed. When that one comes, he will tell us everything we need to know. That's what the woman said. Jesus wanted to convey to this woman that God cannot be confined to one place. Now, some of us Christians keep looking for the right place to worship. Where's the right place to worship? Where's the right church? Where's the right teacher? Where's the right theology? What's the right denomination where I can worship? That's kind of what we do. So here, Jesus told her that the only, I want you to get this, I know you've probably read this before, but the only place of real worship comes from the heart, comes from inner, from us, from our heart, worshiping the true God. That's the place of worship. That's the new place of worship when Jesus came, right here. That's the new place of worship. So she then lets Jesus know that she believes the Messiah will come someday and explain all that, and that is when Jesus asks her to trust him. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And Jesus asks the same to each of us today. Do we trust that he is the Messiah, God in the flesh, and will we trust our entire lives to developing an authentic relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> One more thing Caroline Lewis wrote. Listen to what she said. This is what Jesus offers in John. Not a how-to manual for faith. Not a list of commandments for how to get to heaven. But an intimate and lasting relationship with him that finds its truest expression in trust and love. And see, once we realize the place of worship is from our hearts, worshiping the true God, then we come together like we have come today. This is not the only place of worship. The place of worship is in our hearts. True worship from our hearts to God. It's personal. But then we get to come to this house of worship where true worshipers gather together to worship and pray, and connect, and grow, and get us, guess what else we get to do? We get to come to the Lord's table. You don't do this at Target. You don't do this on the golf course. You don't do this up at the cabin. You do it in church. And you do it with other true, true worshipers. And you get to look around the room and go, oh, you have Jesus too. Oh, you have Jesus too. Isn't this great that we have Jesus? Let's come to the table and remember what he did. And we're going to invite you to do that. But before we do, let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's take a minute as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. <clears throat> Let's examine our own lives and consider this question. Do I have a true, authentic relationship with Jesus, trusting him as the Messiah and trusting him with every area of my life? Now, right now, you realize Jesus is the Messiah.
and you want to trust your life with him. You want to give your life to him and receive him as your Lord and Savior. I encourage you just to say a prayer, something like this. Dear Jesus, I know who you are. I believe you're the Messiah, the Christ. And I want to trust you with my life. I want to invite you to come in and be Lord and Savior of my life and forgive me of my past and my sin and come in and be Lord and sit in my Savior. You can just pray that prayer right now. Whether you're here with us, if you're watching right now online, just pray that prayer. And so, Lord, we, we, we just take a moment now to bless folks who have opened their heart to you today, just like this woman does, as she realizes who you are. And we pray that as we as a congregation as we have gathered here today, that as we come to your table, that we would understand fully the price you paid as you went to the cross. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. When we truly belong to Jesus, when we find we want to remember what he did for us, that's what we do. We truly belong to Jesus and we say, you know what, I want to I wanna thank Jesus for what he did for me. And that's what we're going to do right now. You're invited to join us as we come to the Lord's table and remember together um, what Jesus did. We have open communion here at Oak Hills Church, which means that you don't have to be a, a regular attender or a member to join us for communion. Uh, If this is meaningful to you because of your relationship with Jesus, because you've invited Jesus into your heart, and taking the bread and the cup would be meaningful to you to remember what Jesus did, we invite you to come. You're welcome to come. I want to tell you that in a minute, we're going to invite you to come. We're going to, uh, the band and the worship team are going to lead in a worship song. And as they do, we're going to invite you to come to one of these tables down here, over here, or in the back over here. And uh, uh, this is something I want you to know. When you take the cup and the bread, take it back with you to your, to your place, okay? And then hold it. And then I'll come back and I will lead us together. We're going to partake together, okay? And so you'll see here a communion map, which will give you directions as to where to go. And the ushers will also help you, but we'll start in the front row. If you're in the front row, we're going to invite you to come. And so let's put this time aside now. Let's let the Holy Spirit move in this place. And let's remember, as a group of true worshipers, what Jesus did for us and honor Jesus by remembering that. And so I invite you to come. And let's come to the Lord's table.
song we could ever sing. Yes. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you open up the cup and take the bread, hold it in your hand. Just hold it there. What you're holding in your hand represents the blood of Jesus and his body that was given for you and for me. Can we even imagine, folks, this woman at the point of realization that she was talking to 
Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, would come for her. And maybe you can remember at a point in your life when you had that realization. Maybe you were a little child. Maybe you were an adult. There was a time where you realized that you were overwhelmed and overcome by what Jesus had done and who he is. Well, this is what we're doing now. From our hearts of worship, we are telling Jesus that we remember. We're so grateful. And so this bread is for us to remember, and this cup is for us to remember their emblems of that body and that blood. I want to read to you what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about coming to the communion table. He said, I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is, it represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Before we partake, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's partake together. you just to bow your heads for a moment. I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, just to have one of those conversations with Jesus right now. And from your heart, just say, Jesus, I want you to know that I remember. And I'm so grateful. Then I want you to be bold and be filled with faith as your heads are bowed there, you're praying. Just go ahead and say, Jesus, I really need your touch today in my physical body. I know you went to that cross for my salvation. You went to that cross so that I could be healed. And so if you need a physical touch, if you need a relationship to be healed, if you have anxiety and it's uh, somewhat debilitating, something's happened physically recently that is frightening and scaring you, whatever your need, be bold. Be bold and just say, Jesus, in faith, I want to ask you to touch me and to bring your healing into my body. I ask you to touch this relationship. I ask you to bring about peace into my life. And just receive it. Holy Spirit, come now. Move in this place. Touch every heart. Touch every life. Bring your counsel. Bring your healing. And bring your peace into every family. We pray. pray this in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
and then Jane Lau are right over here. And they'd love to pray with you today. If you are in need of prayer, you've come into this place, you just need someone to agree with you about something. And I'm telling you, it's powerful when you ask other people and you combine your faith and you hear the prayer of someone else. It's amazing how powerful that is. And so if you need prayer today, you've been attending here forever, or this is your first Sunday, and you need prayer, come on up and let Ben and Jane pray for you. If you're not able to come, I want to encourage you to let us know your prayer request. You just, you go to our website, you hit connect, you go down to prayer and care, and um, we will, and you put your prayer request in there, we'll pray for you this week. We always gather right down here, Wednesday, we pray for all those needs, and we'd love to do that. The other thing is, if during this time, or if you're watching online, um, one of the things you can do is go to connect and you go down to follow Jesus and that is a place where you find out more about what it really means to follow Jesus and so I, if you open your heart to Jesus today receive Jesus please go there there are a lot of things there to help you with that next Sunday we're going to continue in this uh, conversation just two Sundays left in this and then we have another second half of the summer yeah second half of the summer is coming and uh we, uh, we're going to do another uh, series, but we have a couple weeks left on this series. And next week, it's uh, Letting Go. I read it. Um, it's kind of the ultimate mic drop moment when, when uh, Jesus says to the woman at the well, when she says, we know the Messiah is coming. And he says, I am he. Drop the mic. <laughs> I am he. And uh, what we're going to look at next week is something interesting that John includes, I don't think by mistake, when the woman left, she left her water jug. She let go. She let go. She just ran away. She left the water jug and ran back to the city. And uh, we're going to talk about letting go next week. We're trusting God. We're trusting Jesus. We let go. And so we encourage you to be a part of it and join us next week. For that series. Uh, you're all invited to spend a few minutes in our big room where we have some hot coffee and um, nothing else, no tea or anything, but we're working on that. So I really want you to drink coffee. It would, it, it would, it would help me in my discipleship of all of you as a pastor if you would just start drinking coffee. Uh, I want to say one thing. In uh, Last week I mentioned that Pastor Jen was looking for a team. I think you got your team full for Oasis, yeah. The other thing Pastor Jen leads of many things is we encourage all of you, something that happens nationally and in Minnesota and especially in Egan and the southern suburbs where many of us live, Minneapolis-St. Paul as well, um, the national night out is a big deal and there are a lot of parties in the neighborhoods. So many of you go to those and if you have one in your neighborhood, I want to encourage you to go. It's such a great way to connect in your neighborhood and reflect just be Jesus there. And so we encourage you to do that. Now, if you don't have one, then Pastor Jen and her team have put together a kit that is available to you to host one. It'll give you instructions on how to host one. And you can sign up to receive one of those on our website. And you just say, I'm going to host one. I need some help. Please give me that kit. And then we'll take it from there. And so we encourage you to do that. It's that first week in August, I believe. And so keep be thinking about that. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. God bless you. We'll see you.